from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, the newly named Dean of the College of Agriculture here at K-State, Ernie Minton, will share his aspirations for the college in the areas of education, research, and extension outreach under his leadership. Ernie talks about the immediate priorities that he intends to address. Then from the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McCohen discusses the principle of eminent domain and what constitutes a private property taking by a public entity. This revolves in large part around how public use of that property is interpreted, and he cites a brand new court ruling out of Iowa that lends to that discussion. Further ahead with Stop, Look, and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. Plus more here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today. The College of Agriculture here at Kansas State University just a few days back officially named its new Dean of Agriculture, who actually has a familiarity with that position as he served prior to that as the Interim Dean of Agriculture at the university. And so it's our first time since that official appointment to visit with Dr. Ernie Minton. Ernie, our congratulations, first of all. Thank you very much, Eric. It's Really an honor to have been uh, selected as the permanent dean of uh, the College of Ag and, of course, also the permanent director of uh, K-State Research and Extension. I'm really happy to be in that position and looking forward to uh, tackling, uh, you know, some daunting tasks. But uh, that's the way we got to look at it. We've got to tackle them and can't uh, kind of push them to the side. So really looking forward to it. Had a, a good a year-long run approximately as interim, and uh, now looking forward to the to the task as a permanent dean and director. Just for brief reflection here, you have been on scene here at Kansas State, though, uh, much more than just a year ago. In fact, you started in the early 80s on the faculty at Animal Sciences and Industry. That's right. Uh, 1983, to be precise, August 18th, 1983, uh, Dr. Don Good hired me uh, into the Department of Animal Sciences and Industry as an assistant professor. And then uh, 2008, coincident with the retirement of Dr. Forrest Chumley, uh, I became first the interim uh, director of the Ag Experiment Station and then later uh, under Dean Cholik, the permanent director. And I, so I remained in that duty, generally speaking. The title changed a little bit with the addition of Associate Dean for Research when Dean uh, John Flores was, uh, was here. So that since 2008. So I had about 11 years in that role approximately. And then, as you noted, have been interim for the past uh, year approximately. With, Ernie, that familiarity with the college for well over three decades now and what's happening with it, does that allow you as the new dean now to get off to a more of a running start perhaps? Well, yeah, Eric, I think it I think it does. A lot of things, you know, uh, I already have an understanding of and our, our thoughts are to really kind of leverage that knowledge to get off to a quick start on some priorities for the college going forward. I might just share a few of those Please, uh, if you with you. Mm-hmm. The entire campus is engaged in a uh, evaluation of and, and hopefully a solution to our slide in enrollment, and our college is not different from that. So we're looking uh, very strategically at how we can approach that, and in particular, focusing on, in addition to Kansas, what states outside of Kansas make sense uh, for our culture, for the, the academic departments we have, and uh, the kind of student that fits for K-State. Certainly, uh, we want to serve the citizens of Kansas, but uh, we also think there are some opportunities for us uh, externally as well. So 
enrollment is one of those things. The other thing that I mentioned when I interviewed, and this was not new news to anyone who's uh, familiar with the college and uh, K-State Research and Extension, we have uh, quite a bit of work to do to get our uh, facilities uh, upgraded, and we're going to be working on that really very, very purposefully uh, through the course of the uh, of this first year in terms of planning and trying to do our best in terms of organizing what projects maybe uh, go first and uh, those kinds of things that we can maybe delay for a little bit longer. As you inventory our buildings... Needs abound. Yeah, there, <laughs> there isn't a single one in which uh, we don't have a need. And so what we have to do really is kind of a triage approach. What do we need to do first? And then we move on to, to other priorities uh, next. We'll quite likely be starting with the Schellenberger Hall, which is the Department of Grain Sciences and Industry. We've had some issues to deal with there that are pretty pressing. So we're going to be focusing on that. But, you know, there there could be some reshuffling the, the presence of parts of other departments and so on in that new Schellenberger complex uh, going forward. So that work will take Preston here pretty quickly. You mentioned enrollment and uh, shoring it up for the future. On the research and extension sides, both of which you have a great familiarity, yeah. what would be your general vision for the needs there? Good point. Absolutely. Of course, uh, consistent with our uh, land-grant mission, quite obviously we're involved in uh, food and ag research, natural resources research, and all of those elements uh, in extension as well. We're going to be focused, uh, quite obviously, on keeping our research uh, and extension program strong. And, of course, we can't just think about the the Manhattan campus. We've got to think about those statewide units which, you know, have needs in particular. And, of course, many of those are related to open uh, uh, staffing positions that, again, identifying the priorities, uh, trying not to leave any gaps uh, as best we can. And that's not always easy. Ernie, in as far as interacting with the stakeholders out there as the lead representative of the College of Agriculture at K-State, what are your aspirations along that line? That's a great point. We really thrive on, and in fact, uh, it's it's really kind of core to our mission to be deeply engaged with the stakeholders uh, in the state. And so I haven't developed a detailed plan as yet, but in general, the idea is to get out in the state and kind of uh, refresh old acquaintances uh, as those may be, and those that I need to uh, introduce myself to uh, will be making a point to to do that for sure. Uh, Again, one of, I think, the strengths of uh, K-State and uh, the college and K-State Research and Extension is our keen interaction and sensitivity to the needs of uh, the stakeholders in the state. So absolutely, that will that will be on the plan in one form or another going forward. So uh, we'll be really very focused on that, particularly in the first probably 9 to 12 months, right. for sure. Putting it in this context, say over the next five years for sake of discussion, What is your hope in terms of the College of Agriculture and its status at that point from Mm -hmm. here to there? Mm -hmm. That's a a good question. It's hard to know at this point in time what the, you know, ideal enrollment for the college. So this is wearing the dean's hat only at this moment. But we could set as a target maybe to gain back where we were back to approximately 2014 when we enrollment began to to peak. So, you know, if we could get back to or close to those levels, I'd say that would be uh, ideal from from an enrollment perspective. We're kind of thinking in in those terms, but of course what that means is we need to be staffed adequately with those that can be in the classroom and provide academic advising and so on at the level that it it needs to be. I hope, too, in the next... uh, you know, three to five years that we're well along our way to the initial stages, too, of of upgrading those facilities. Mm -hmm. 
One of the things I didn't mention, which is also another priority, is we really have a pressing need out at the Dairy Teaching and Research Unit. We made quite a bit of progress with regard to planning there and really on the verge of uh, rolling out a plan for that, which will include, you know, a plan for fundraising as well. So I hope we have uh, that accomplished uh, in the next, with, certainly within the next five years. And like, you know, next week would be great, actually, but that's <laughs> right. not realistic. So that that would be a, a, another priority as well. And I certainly hope that we have made progress uh, on the, the priority buildings. And again, I'm, I'm thinking we will have done something with uh, Schellenberger Hall. The scenario as it sits today is that building is way past renovation. We've worn it out, and uh, it needs to come down. And mm-hmm. so I hope we've got that down at least. And, and if, if we're lucky, we've got a new uh, building coming up in that footprint uh, we also have plans for renovation of Waters Hall. We hear a lot of parents and grandparents saying, oh, it looks just like it did when they were here in school. And so, and it uh, does. It, exactly. <laughs> <In> respect. <laughs> it, it, it does. So we want to make some progress there as well. But the core strengths of the college remain, and that helps move all of this forward. Really. That's exactly right, and it's absolutely clear that what we get accomplished happens as a result of uh, really dedicated faculty and staff who are committed to the mission. We have great students and stakeholders who support us, and those are the kinds of things that really make uh, College of Ag and K-State Research and Extension great. We hope to visit with you periodically for updates on all of these matters as they come together. And once more, congratulations. We appreciate your time, Ernie. Thank you very much, Eric. Happy to do it. Once more, he was named just recently as the Dean of the College of Agriculture and Director of K-State Research and Extension here at Kansas State University. Ernie Minton with us on this part of Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Now in the spotlight, the principle of eminent domain as a legal mechanism for a, a public entity to acquire private property. And you agricultural landowners would definitely benefit by being familiar with this. Roger McCohen is with us once more. As you know, Roger is a professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law. He has an article on this very topic in his blog list from this past week. Well, Roger, pointing out that this has gone through a lot of twists and turns in in court rulings over the years, but what is eminent domain? Well, Eric, eminent domain is, uh, at its core, it's the power of the state to take private property for public use, consistent with the state's constitution. We think of the taking power at the federal level. Eminent domain is the comparable power at the state level. And that's by design. The federal government at some point had designated that authority to the states, did it not? Well, yeah, the the government has the inherent authority to take your property. It's Mm -hmm. just from a constitutional standpoint, they have to pay for what they take, and the taking is supposed to be for a public use. And that's where the rub has been over the years, and and in terms of what that actually means. Let's get right to that. What is meant by public use? What falls under that heading? (laughs) That's quite a broad swath, or could be. Is that correct? Yeah, it is, Eric, and it's really the major constraint on government action, uh, how we define public use. And historically, it was understood to mean that if property was to be taken, it had to be used by the public. 
the fact that the taking was beneficial was not enough. But eventually, over time, courts concluded that a wide range of uses could serve the public, even if the public did not, in fact, have possession uh, of the property that was taken. And there were so many exceptions that were eventually built into the general rule of use by the public that the rule itself was abandoned. Some people think back to the famous Kelo case involving a city in Connecticut a number of years ago, um, the city of New London, Connecticut, against Kelo, but as eroding that right and abandoning the public use provision. But actually, the Supreme Court had cast it aside in 1954 and again in 1984 uh, by its willingness to very expansively define public use. And that's where the problem comes in in many situations for farm and ranch and, and land owners and people that own rural land. Can your property be taken from you, one, by a quasi-private company, and two, perhaps entirely by a private company for its own purposes, where the public benefit is just tangential? It's not really a public use, but uh, the benefit might be greater jobs or, or higher tax base. Mm-hmm. Is that really what the Constitution means by public use? Let's define also, as we're going about this, what property means in the context of an eminent domain or a taking situation. Well, property uh, is defined by state law. And so we have to look to state law to see what the term property means. So in the context of eminent domain at the state level, that connotes all types of ownership interests. could be fee simple, absolute outright ownership in real estate. It could be partial interest, future interest, surface interests, and even perhaps subsurface interests. And in fact, we had a Texas case decided by the Texas Supreme Court in 2012 where that court unanimously held on the basis of oil and gas law that land ownership in Texas includes interest in in in-place groundwater. So water cannot be taken for public use without adequate compensation guaranteed by the state constitution. So our definition of property is important because if property is taken, then the state constitution requires that the government pay for it. So we tend to favor a more broader from a landowner standpoint, a more broader definition of the term property. And that's why it could conceivably mean all those types of various property interests, including, as in Texas, uh, in-place underground water. It seems, though, Roger, in looking at this, that back to the public use consideration here, that that is defined somewhat differently with each passing case. And that leads us to the latest case out of the Iowa Supreme Court on a pipeline that was placed through that state? That's right. This is the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is designed to pipe oil from the Bakken fields in northwest North Dakota all the way to oil refineries in the southern part of Illinois. So it it very neatly bisects the state of Iowa from the northwest corner to the extreme southeast corner, and it goes through a a lot of counties on its way through. And of course, it's going um, under a lot of farmland. And so there were some landowners in the line of that pipeline that refused to convey easements to the pipeline company to sell easements to them. And so the company was faced with um, following state law to seek the power of eminent domain. So here you have a private company that is trying to exercise eminent domain to get its pipeline through because there were landowners that didn't want to grant easements. Well, this wound its way through the system, if you will. The Iowa Utilities Board uh, became involved in the allowance of this pipeline, to put it that way. And then the, the board itself and its action was challenged in court? That's right, yeah. The Dakota Access Pipeline, you're dealing with a company there that is deemed to be a common carrier under state law. Now, a common carrier is a public or private entity that carries goods or people. So a pipeline company does that. We've got various types of energy companies that run uh, high wire transmission lines. That's that's what we would call a common carrier. That invokes a, a state law process in many states. And in Iowa, it brings into play the Iowa Utilities Board. And so they have to get approval from the Iowa Utilities Board. There has to be hearings held on the petition that the pipeline company would assert where they're asserting their eminent domain power. So you've got a lot of people that uh, show up at these uh, hearings, they give testimony, and uh, ultimately what resulted was that the Iowa Utilities Board in early 2016 issued a final decision. They produced a 159-page report, and the order accompanying that said, well, they found that the 
pipeline would promote the public convenience and necessity, would involve a capital investment in Iowa of about $1.35 billion, would generate millions of dollars of sales tax during construction and millions of dollars of property tax. And so they're looking there at, okay, there is a benefit to the state of the pipeline. And uh, they also noted that the pipeline had done a lot of work uh, and utilized the best technology that they had to lay the pipeline in a path to avoid critical areas and uh, allow them to exercise eminent domain where necessary to complete the line. Mm -hmm. And so the Iowa Utilities Board issues the order, and there were other challenges to that. Uh, All of those were denied. And then you end up in the court system. So you got to go through this administrative process in Iowa, and that's the way it's going to be in other states, too. you got to go through the regulatory body's administrative process, exhaust those remedies before you can get into a court. And then it did, in fact, work its way up the court system from the trial court to eventually the Iowa Supreme Court, which rendered its ruling here just a few weeks ago. And what developed there, if you would? Well, the Iowa Supreme Court, what they're doing is they're reviewing uh, what the Iowa Utilities Board did and whether their decision was based on uh, following state law procedures and whether there was a sufficient benefit or public benefit to the state of Iowa. And the Supreme Court said that there was. Uh, They said the pipeline is a common carrier. The Iowa Utilities Board does have the authority to issue a construction permit to the company based on the promotion of public convenience and necessity. And the court determined they made their decision that was rational, it was logical, it was justifiable, and the factual determinations were supported by substantial evidence. So as a reviewing body, without uh, reweighing all of the evidence, they're just looking at the evidence that the uh, Iowa Utilities Board had in front of it. And they said the Iowa Utilities Board acted appropriately. There was a sufficient public benefit here to the state, and they're going to let the Dakota Access Pipeline condemn the necessary easements to finish the pipeline. Now, the landowners are going to get paid, Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just taking it without the the farmers uh, across Iowa getting paid. They're going to get paid, but the landowners uh, will have that pipeline underneath their ground. It's not going to interfere with their surface use. And the court said where there is subsurface drainage tile, farm field drainage tile, the pipeline has to go under that drainage tile so as to not interfere with it. So, Roger, what do you think this Iowa Supreme Court ruling lends to the conversation about eminent domain as it would affect, in our case, agricultural landowners, given all of this other case law preceding it? Well, the question has always been, uh, what is the extent to which public use must be present? That's a key issue. Now, I would say that we just had a United States Supreme Court decision last week which was very important on this issue and, in fact, overturned 34 years of precedent, uh, which gives a landowner the direct right to go to federal court rather than through the state court system on a takings claim. And I'll be writing about that in a future post in in the near future. Hmm. That's a big development. The other issue here is what is the uh, scope of public use? And that's the one thing that we really need to watch in in terms of future case law. Well, landowners, it is worth your while to have an understanding of what eminent domain is all about. And for starters, you might go to Roger's blog on the website. It's dated Monday, June the 17th on eminent domain and agriculture. You can find the link to that at washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. We appreciate the word, Roger. Many thanks. We'll talk again soon. Thank you, Rick. He is a professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law and, by the way, an adjunct professor in the Agricultural Economics Department here at Kansas State University, likewise. Roger McCohen with us every other week to talk agricultural law matters here on Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128-plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today, and welcome back. Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines for you, these courtesy in part of DTN. President Donald Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping will be meeting Saturday during the G20 summit in Osaka, Japan, At least one senior administration official is not willing to commit to whether those talks are aimed at restarting the talks between the two sides that broke down back in May, or whether they're aimed at reaching a more formal agreement. It's really just an opportunity for the president to maintain his engagement with his Chinese counterpart, according to this official. That official, who went unnamed, said even as the trade frictions persist, he, the president, has the opportunity to see where the Chinese side is since the talk last left off. Now, the president remains insistent that there needs to be structural real reform in China across a number of issues and a number of sectors, and nothing about that, according to another administration official, has changed. That same official noted the breakdown in talks have not changed the ultimate goal of the effort. Meantime, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin held a telephone discussion with Chinese Vice Premier Liu He back on Monday. That's according to a statement from the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. The two sides exchanged views on trade based on instructions from the leaders of the two countries, according to that statement, and the two sides agreed to maintain communications. That call took place at the request of the U.S., according to the Xinhua News Agency. Commerce Ministry spokesperson Jing Shuang provided no details on the coming talks between Presidents Trump and Xi, but said that China remained committed to developing relations between the two sides based on coordination and cooperation. Arguing against regulations classifying livestock as drugs, the National Pork Producers Council wants the Food and Drug Administration to yield regulatory oversight to the USDA for gene-edited animals raised for food. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue also told producers this past weekend that he would lobby the president to make that happen. On a call with reporters yesterday, leaders with the NPPC explained that gene editing technology could create opportunities to make hogs resistant to diseases such as porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, or PERS. Experts reiterated that gene editing is a targeted process that doesn't necessarily lead to inserting a new gene. Often the focus is to eliminate a gene that's tied to disease susceptibility. Such technology in breeding could lead to reduced antibiotic use by the livestock industry. FDA regulations, though, treat the genes in gene-edited animals as a pharmaceutical, creating massive regulatory challenges. NPPC leaders said that an executive order should require the FDA to reconsider its regulatory regime around gene editing. Now, speaking at that event this past Sunday in Council Bluffs, Iowa, Secretary Purdue told producers that the USDA should have at least some oversight of gene-edited livestock. Purdue said he would ask the president to require the FDA to share that authority. The president earlier this month signed an executive order telling regulators to simplify how they regulate biotechnology in both crops and animals. Purdue said the executive order requires agencies across the federal government to come together and talk about what's the right policy, he said, to make more safe, more resilient, and more sustainable crops using biotechnology, both in animals and in plants, going forward. Well, what has happened with the animal antibiotic industry and its sales since 2017's implementation of the Veterinary Feed Directive? A USDA researcher has looked into that question. Here's more from the USDA's Rod Bain. Restrictions on animal antibiotics, particularly those that promote growth in livestock, have been in place the last two years. Yet before the Veterinary Feed Directive took effect... Between after about several years of steady increases in sales of antibiotics for food animal production in the United States between 2009 and 2015, between 2015 and 2017, you see this 30% drop in those sales. What USDA economic researcher Stacy Sneringer calls a big drop in animal pharmaceutical sales after those years of steady increase. 
lives. She says research shows the economic impacts of the veterinary feed directive are just one of the factors behind the sales decline. The regulations weren't fully into effect until 2017, so the change from 2016 to 2017 is probably capturing the effect of that regulation. And the drop between 2015 and 2016 is either producers basically getting ready for the regulation or some of that might be the drop in use from poultry producers. Yet the study shows despite the decrease in sales, meat and milk production remain the same over that same time period. In a way, big worry that producers were going to be switching. They're just going to say, we were using stuff for growth promotion and now we're using the exact same thing for disease prevention. I guess the good news from those sales numbers is that that doesn't appear to be happening. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Well, the Kansas beef cattle industry has built a reputation for having some of the most progressive ranchers in the country. Scarlett Higgins tells us here another accomplishment has been added to the state's lofty national standing. Hinks and Angus Ranch of Cottonwood Falls was named the Beef Improvement Federation Seed Stock Producer of the Year June 20th during the group's annual meeting and symposium in Brookings, South Dakota. The award is presented annually to recognize the dedication of an individual operation to improving the beef industry at the seed stock level. The ranch is owned by Frank Hinkson Jr. and his son Trey, who is the fourth generation to be involved in the family business. Cattle on the Flint Hills Ranch include both fall and spring calving herds as well as a large number of commercial heifers purchased each year, mostly from bull customers. A small herd of registered Charlet were added in response to the needs of some commercial cow herd customers wanting to add terminal genetics. Hinks and Angus produces practical, balanced trait cattle that will work in a real-world environment. The Hinksons have been early to adopt scientific advancements in new technology. More than 500 beef producers, academia, and industry stakeholders were in attendance at the South Dakota meeting. The BIF mission is to promote greater acceptance of beef cattle performance evaluation. I'm Scarlett Hagens. And a quick calendar reminder, K-State Research and Extension's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes will be hosting its annual Weed Management Field Day this coming Tuesday, July the 2nd. That will include discussions and demonstrations related to weed control for corn, soybeans, grain, sorghum, and sunflower. The program will get going around 8 o'clock in the morning. It will conclude at around 1.30. They will, among other things, have a herbicide drift simulation on soybeans as part of that program. No cost to attend the field day lunch will be provided but they're asking you to pre-register you can do so either online at hayes.k-state.edu or by calling this number 785-625-3425 785-625-3425 you're listening to agriculture today For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. In my class, there was a Korean War veteran studying on the GI Bill, the Australian version. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. I graduated from Hawkesbury Agriculture College, Richmond, New South Wales, Australia, on May 23, 1957. I was excused from the actual graduation ceremony as I had returned to the Netherlands to get married. I had my priorities, and the hard work of studying was done. I graduated. A few years later... Hawkesbury Agriculture College would become part of Sydney University. None of us old boys liked that move, but as agriculture was rapidly changing, that was the way to go. 
However, I am glad that my time was still under the older system where the bonding with classmates was strong and permanent. You entered with 65 freshmen, and at the end, after the three years of theory and the practical work, you graduated with a good knowledge of agriculture in all its diversity with the 65 classmates you had started with. Final exams consisted of one week of written exams and one week oral. Any questions relating and yes beyond could be asked even from the first day you started. That meant note-taking and saving notes was a must. Remember, in 1957 we had no computers or cell phones. In my class, there was a Korean War veteran studying on the GI Bill, the Australian version. He was married, hence could live off campus. We had dormitories, dining halls, etc. It was set up on the English system. Australia needed farmers and stockmen who could make it under Australia's harsh conditions. To make farmers better farmers, the college was started in 1891. Land was chosen near Richmond, New South Wales. The original farm was set up on close to 3,500 acres of good, average and poor soil. What has always interested me is that all aspects of agriculture were taught and all were part of the curriculum. There was animal science, beef, cattle, dairy, pigs, poultry, and of course sheep and horses. But horsepower was rapidly fading, except for the ranch horses for sheep and cattle work. There was agronomy with crops and pasture improvement, of course the soil sciences, botany and the like, such as plant pathology, entomology, were taught. There was orcharding and beekeeping, and as horses faded out, the necessary farm machines and the tractors. All was backed up by the sciences, but the beauty was that application of all was a very important part, which is why the graduates were so suited and ready for the land. With the diversity, the specialization could come for some after graduating, and I am an example of that. What is also interesting is that attending Hawkesbury often became a family tradition. We see that here at KSU as well. It might be an uncle and a nephew, as the following quote will show. When I came across it, it reminded me of the fact that farming is different, special. The letter expresses the feelings of many old boys. The uncle writes, Dear Tom, so you are going to Hawkesbury College, maybe to sleep under the same roof tree as I did, to eat enormous meals in the dining room, to doze over lectures in the same hall. Trade, commerce, banking, manufacture are jobs. Medicine, law, engineering are professions. Agriculture is a way of life. You live on the job. You don't travel to it by a suburban train mornings and go home from it evenings when the whistle blows. You stay with it 24 hours a day. You can toy with other interests, but farming is a serious business. You can make it sordid as the tasks of Hercules or make it an inspiration and an incentive. You can run a successful poultry farm, producing thousands of dozens of eggs, and wholly miss the beauty of the beetle green of an Orpington's plumage rooster. You can spend your life milking cows for a handsome monetary profit and never know the excitement of raising a bull with the gait, poise, deportment and physique of an aristocrat. You may raise him, of course, but if you have no 
innate appreciation of quality and symmetry, you are going to miss something, a real something. Farming isn't merely a way of making money. It's a way of life. Will someone help you, chaps, realize something of the glory of English literature, of the great music of old Beethoven or Brahms? I have a voice like an asthmatic crow, but in the middle of a hundred acres paddock behind a four-horse plow, I have sung the prologue to Pagliassi to my own personal satisfaction. And as far as I know, and able to judge no permanent harm to the horses. There will always be hard work, but it will be work with machinery from now on. Watch out, you don't get too mechanized yourselves. So much for the uncle's writing. Remember, farming is a way of life. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. With that, our Wednesday edition comes to a close. Please rejoin us right here this same time tomorrow, won't you? Until then, Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.